Since the dawn of time, man has been curious. And for almost as long, the Vibes Broadcast Network has sought the truth. Investigate. Discuss. Explore. Okay. Maybe in other episodes, but this one is just... Listen to the Vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I'm here Miss Rachel Astarte. And she is the creator and host of a podcast called Self Talk with Rachel Astarte. And also a, is this correct, a transpersonal psychotherapist? Yeah, yeah, that's correct life coach and an author so i had to write all this down i wasn't gonna remember <laughs> uh, but your book is called celebrating solitude how to develop and honor your higher self mm -hmm. so before we get started with that just tell me a little bit about yourself yeah sure um so as you mentioned i'm a, a psychotherapist and a coach um that wasn't what i started out being or what my dream was i originally started in the arts as a writer and an actor and um <clears throat> and then eventually uh, i wanted to communicate i mean the whole thing is about communication right, right. the arts and trying to express yourself and connect with others and I became a life coach uh, shortly after my son was born. Um, and that was great. I love doing life coaching. I still do life coaching, obviously. And um, but it, I still felt like I wanted to do more or learn more about different ways to help people. So I went back and got my master's in marriage and family therapy. Five years later, I got my license and uh, and now I have a, a practice. Oh, yeah, you're like me. I, I love to talk and I'm, I, there's just something about uh, engaging in a conversation with others and, you know, just finding out what how people tick, you know, what's all about them. And there's so much negativity going on in the world right now. I wanted to do something positive. So that's the reason for the show and reason why I seek out people like you because you have something to share and we're trying to help people motivate them inspire them so um tell me a little bit about your your psychotherapy yeah um well i i've been told i'm not your traditional therapist so when we think about therapy we think about okay you're gonna sit in a chair on a couch and the other person's you know the therapist is opposite you with the notepad and you know and mm -hmm. tell me about your childhood now i do talk about those things well first of all my practice is entirely virtual mm -hmm. so um so i work with uh people either in a therapy capacity or in a coaching capacity de depending on where they are and what they need um but uh because i do transpersonal psychotherapy or you might say holistic i work with mind body and spirit so we're not just talking about um tell me about your childhood here are some here are some um th here's the things that are wrong with you that you need to fix you know mm -hmm. um i actually approach it from the perspective that there is nothing wrong with you that what you're perceiving as a problem is actually your internal alert system telling you that something is offline and that you need to just get online and you're not broken. It's just, for example, if we get uh, in our car, we get the light on the dashboard that says it's time to change the oil. We don't say, well, the car's broken. Mm -hmm. We say the car needs to have its oil changed. I'm gonna take it to the mechanic and get the oil changed, right? So going to a therapist is like going to the mechanic just change the oil just change the things that aren't working for you and you will function again it doesn't mean you have to throw the car away or that the car is bad or wrong and neither is the person so when we have depression when we have anxiety this is simply something that's in our self-regulating system of our bodies and our minds and our spirits that's saying mm, something's not right i don't feel good about it can you please do something about that <laughs> you know can you please sort something out and so coming to me we work with all levels 
So we do the mind, you know, obviously that's typical talk therapy. Mm -hmm. We work with the body. We might do meditation, breath work, somatic experiencing, um, where we actually feel the emotions uh, and talk about them and, and, and befriend them in a way. And then of course, spirituality is something that runs through all of us, all around us all the time. And so uh, I work with each patient's specific spiritual focus. Sometimes I work with Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, uh, but I also work with people who are just generally spiritual or people who are um, shamanic practitioners as I am. So what I, I'm, I'm well versed in many different religions as well as spiritual practices. So we can use whatever language you th that you use. So that's basically how it works. And, and, and it really is a collaborative effort that I'm not going to sit here and tell you as the authority how you need to fix your life because you are the authority on your life. And you think, oh my God, that's way too much. I can't handle that. I'm not the authority. If I wouldn't be seeing you if I knew how to. Yes, you are the authority, but I'm going to ask you the questions that are going to bring that power out of you, if that makes sense. Yeah. It, it, well, it seems to me that uh, the th at least the therapists that I've seen in the past, it's like we, we already have the answers, but we just haven't retrieved them. And the, the therapist kind of gets us to that point, like, well, geez, I, I should have thought of that before. Right. I mean, is that how, I mean, how you approach things just like, Hey, you've got the answer in you. I'm just trying to get it out of you. Yeah. Or, or usually what ha happens is that much like you and I are talking, we'll have a conversation about what's going on in this person's life. And as I, I, I just become what I call genuinely curious. What, when did you start feeling depressed? what was what was the last you know when did you really feel that feeling that you weren't worth anything and one of the best questions is the voices in your head whose are they because they're not yours the voices that are telling you uh you're not good enough you're not smart enough you don't you know you're not attractive enough or whatever you'll never make it those are not your voices you weren't born with that voice we're all born perfect you know yeah. and so who told you that? And sometimes it's easy. Oh, well, my parents, oh, the teachers at school or the kids on the playground or people that I looked to to connect with and they let me down. It doesn't mean they're bad people, but at that moment when you needed connection, they weren't there. And what happens to our beautiful, big, beautiful brains is they're like computers mm -hmm. and we receive the software um, uh, the, so the information in the software, and we just play it over and over again in our brains until we change the software, change the message in the software. And, and so, um, it's really a matter of, of shifting our perception. Do you find when people are in a, a, a depressed state for whatever reason that they subconsciously try to like harm themselves without really thinking about, Hey, I'm going to go, you know, I want to end things. They just abuse themselves with drugs and alcohol. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. When when we are in pain due to trauma, and that's usually what is the source of depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, and a lot of other uh, mental um, issues. What's really happening is we're we're we feel lost. We don't, you know, we don't. No, we don't have the tools that we need. And so when we hear, I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe harm myself or I'm going to um, just be self-destructive. Right. This is a natural response to ending pain that you're going through from, a, from the trauma. It's a natural response. Again, no judgment, right? If we have had an abusive childhood or been through terribly traumatic events in our lives, of course we want to end that pain and of course we're going to grab it the, the easiest thing possible for some people it's food or sex or drugs or alcohol or gambling or whatever it is that's a natural response because all you're trying to do is end the pain and on the other end of the spectrum you have people who are at that point where they are saying i don't want to live here anymore i don't want to live in this life anymore and we may actually deal with suicidal feelings What's really powerful about suicidal feelings um, and a different way to look at them 
is that you don't necessarily want to end your life. You want to end this life that you've been living. So again, it's a natural response to want to end pain. And you think by doing that, I just have to take myself off the planet. What needs to really happen is to kill the part of you that has suffered. That's the desire is to kill the part of you that is in pain, not the whole being. Right. Well, in I wanted to let you know I'm 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 using myself as an example mm -hmm. because well number one I don't want to you know out anybody for whatever problems they're having and I can only really speak for myself but having something traumatic happen as a child um, I was molested uh, how do you help someone get past that you know mm -hmm. it's even though I'm I, I'm living my life it's still kind of is in the back of my mind and I really just want it to be, I, I want to cope with it, get, get this feeling over with. Yeah. Yeah. So, so part of the work and it's a, it's a long period of work when, especially when you're dealing with childhood trauma, um, the basis of all my work is about developing a foundation of self, a healthy foundation of self. When you can, um, feel grounded and centered in who you are, who you are as, a, as an adult, right? It's much easier to deal with this pain, but we do go back. I do a lot of inner child work with, with people who were abused, um, whether physically, sexually, emotionally. Um, part of it is understanding that the child part of you did what they could at that time to survive. Mm -hmm. And it worked, it worked. That child was strong enough to, to keep going with whatever mechanisms it needed to get to where you are now. So a lot of the work is gratitude for that child. And also what's absolutely 100% necessary is a grieving process. We can't change the past, but we can change our association with the past when we do really deep inner child work. And that means being with that child protecting that child, helping that child, loving that child. And almost like a domino effect, when we do a lot of work with, with the inner child and we bring that child into our adulthood, a lot of uh, the domino effect is a lot of the trauma just falls like, like dominoes because now we feel uh, stronger as a grown up. We can actually protect that child, you know? I, I recommend to all of my patients that, especially those with childhood trauma, to keep a photograph of yourself as a child whenever the trauma occurred um, by your desk or by your bed and look that child in the face every day and, and give him or her love. You know, I have my picture of my child up here in my, at my desk, which I do the same. I say, I do this for you. I do this work for you. Um, and it's really important. So it's like really, redefining your relationship with yourself as a child and having that child become an ally but also becoming the protector of that child um it's a really beautiful devotional practice that's one of the ways that i work with people with childhood trauma okay so when someone is wanting to uh in themselves mm -hmm. and they they cope with it uh for myself I think of my my wife, my children, my grandchildren, and the people that I'm trying to help when I'm doing the show. Mm -hmm. Not so much for me. It, is there is that a way that people cope with it? Is that the right way to cope with it? Or how do I want to just, you know, go on for myself? Yeah, that's part of it. Building that foundation of self is what's important so that what you're doing comes from a place of love right? There's no, there's no limit to love that we can hold in our hearts. Mm -hmm. So when I work with a patient, we work with developing the foundation of self so that we learn to love ourselves. We learn to understand our place in this life. Um, and then all of that love um, is able to spill out everywhere around us, to our family, to our friends, to our colleagues, to the clerk at the grocery store, you know, whatever, right? So, so it is wonderful to say, um, I don't 
I don't want to leave this earth because I, I want to be here for my family and they need me and they would be devastated. But it's a very different thing to develop a sense of self so deeply that you say, I have a purpose here. And I have had some, I've had a terrible uh, experience or several terrible experiences in my life that have made me stronger, that have made me recognize my survival is so powerful. I mean, wow, right? And and so so I'm so proud of myself for having come this far. And I'm I'm so it's it's love and and care that you're giving to yourself. And what you're really doing is giving it to the child who was abused. Okay, now coping with someone that I mean if you if you're someone that has someone close to you that has ended themselves. Mm -hmm. Um from for instance, uh, my father and my my brother, they yeah. both ended their lives. Sorry. And anyway, how how especially since I didn't give myself the chance to feel at that moment, I I just as much alcohol and drugs as I could ingest <clears throat> at the time just to keep me from feeling. How yeah. do you help someone get back to that point where they they get have those feelings and then can move on yeah that's a process kyle and what what it really is is a gentle slow uh allowance of a grieving process that you didn't have that means you have to be in a safe place to grieve mm -hmm. you know and so finding a, a therapist you trust that will allow you to take your time and to help you almost like you help a child step into the into the ocean little foot by little foot you know it's it's scary it's scary one of the things about grief is that we feel like it's never going to end mm -hmm. and and that's just not true grief just like any other emotion and, and process is transient you know we'd love to be in a semi-orgasmic state all day long but it goes away, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? But so does so do the negative feelings. So do, so grief is actually very healing uh, when we allow ourselves to to grieve productively. So what's the difference between productive and non-productive grief? Productive grief is saying, I am embodying my pain. I'm embracing the loss that that you know your father your brother or anyone else who 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 you've experienced in your life who is who has um committed suicide is to say i'm i'm i have a tremendous amount of pain i'm going to feel it fully to allow it to leave my body to allow it to express itself just like when we get a cut Right. What happens? We bleed. Why are we bleeding to get the toxins out? Right. That's a, bleeding as scary as it looks is actually healing us from from getting an infection. Right. Because blood is is sterile and it's it's actually cleaning us, even though it looks a mess. It looks horrifying. Same thing with grief. It looks a mess. I'm screaming. I'm crying. I'm holding my pillow. My face looks like I've just been punched. But you're cleansing yourself of that pain. Right. And so it's really important to go through that process. Grief knows its own way. It will complete when it's time. And it doesn't mean you'll never cry again. I lost my father. Um, my godfather also uh, committed suicide and uh, my father did not. But my father died of cancer and all, all of this very devastating. And but I, you know, that my father died 20 years ago, and I still have moments where I'm just, my heart hurts, hurts. When those moments happen, I let them happen because that's a gift. It means you're human. It means that you are feeling feelings, which is so much healthier than not feeling them sure, as you've sure. experienced, right? So part of it is loving the grief. So that's productive grief. Non-productive grief is staying in a place where, um, you are not motivated you're you're digging yourself deeper into pain and you're not letting it heal you mm -hmm. you're, you're you're clinging to the sad feeling and identifying with it as opposed to saying 
I'm moving this up and through my body in a healthy way. And I'm, I'm going to, my going through this is going to help me be a better person and maybe even help someone else who's going through it too later, you know, because we're all connected. Uh, another question about it, and I'll, I'll move on to another subject, but we have a family member who seems like he's insistent upon ending himself. I mean, short of just manhandling him and throwing him into a, a facility, what do you do? What is a person to do when you, you want to see this person get better, but they don't seem to want to themselves? Yeah, that's, that is very tricky. And, and in a situation like that, and, and again, I can't, I can't diagnose or, or tell you what to do with this family member, but in certain general circumstances, sometimes um, as a family member, all you can do is show and express love as much as you can. Let them know how important they are. You can't say you necessarily understand what they're going through, but you can hold space for them feeling whatever pain they're feeling and just continue to encourage them to get help, get help. Because, uh, and this is a really important point too, a lot of people think that if you go see a therapist, it means that you're broken or that something's wrong with you and it's, it's shameful, that somehow you failed. And in, in fact, it's the opposite. And that might be something that you can tell someone who's at that point is it takes strength to ask for help and and it, there is help out there i i've been depressed i've been deeply depressed in my life which is one of the reasons i got into therapy how would i get myself out of this how could i help someone else get out of this mm -hmm. you know and part of it is understanding um that you have you have a purpose. No one here was born by accident, right? It's true. The creator does not make mistakes, <laughs> right? And I don't mean that necessarily in a, in a Judeo-Christian sense. I mean, we're all here because we're here to contribute to collective consciousness. So what are you contributing? Just by being alive. Not You don't have to do anything special. Just by, just by petting a cat. Just by, you know, just by hugging a child, that makes a difference in somebody's life, right? So little mm -hmm. things like that. So to tell someone who's at that point, listen, it takes strength and it's actually a sign of, of, of great power to say, um, I feel so low right now, but I'm still gonna go and just talk to someone once. I'm gonna talk to somebody at least once and just see if, if there's help that I can get. Um, and, and it really helps to find the right therapist too. It has to be someone that the person jives with, you know, it, can, it can't be just like any old person you get off the internet, you know, you have to talk to them, talk to them. I mean, I know myself, I've had terrible luck with therapists throughout my life. I just like, really, how did you even get licensed? You know, <laughs> so, um, and it, you know, it's, it's really important, but I would say love, hold space, and the reminder that you are here for a reason and it looks really low right now, please consider just talking to a good person. And it may not even be a typical therapist. Yeah. You know, it could be a spiritual advisor, it could be um, a mentor, right? Whatever, let's say your your family member is low, but they're really into um sharpshooting or something like that. Good, go find a mentor and go do some sharpshooting, you know, go um uh whatever it is swim um learn to knit or whatever, whatever you're into to find somebody to to who does that you know or something that you're interested in that keeps you here it doesn't always have to be a, a professional person that helps okay now you help people I'm, I'm assuming that are in toxic relationships as well right yeah oh yeah Okay, so you have someone in your life that they're in a toxic relationship, or they keep getting in one toxic relationship after another. What do you, what do, you do to help people get out of that situation? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I only help people get out of situations they're not happy with, right? So if somebody is in a toxic, chronically toxic relationships, 
and they're okay with it, then there's nothing to talk about. But so we're, we're assuming here that they want to get out of it in the first place. Um, again, it comes back to patterning, right? So what are the messages you're telling yourself about yourself? Um, where did those messages come from? Uh, what is it that you think about yourself? Who are you attracting to yourself? These are the lines of questioning uh, that I might offer. And, and we can find out um, what, might, what might make a person repeatedly get into uh, unhealthy relationships. And it, a lot of it has to do with messaging received as, as children. You know that you're not good enough or that you won't amount to much so what do you do or it could also be that your parents you know what did the relationships in your life look like when you were growing up how did your parents behave and if you don't have a good model for what a relation a healthy relationship looks like guess what you're going to repeat that why why do we want i don't want to be like my parents at all i'll tell you why it's because unconsciously we want to fix it Mm -hmm. So we, what we do is we, we we're watching the play of our parents on a stage, right? And we're on, we're in the play with them. We don't like that play at all. But what we end up doing is we just rearrange the furniture and recast, and we just set the stage up all over again with the same situation because we want the ending to be different, but it isn't, right? The only way the ending is going to be different is if we change and if we deal with the trauma that we had as a child or deal with whatever it was that we saw that wasn't healthy um so that we can uh make different choices um as we as we get older now i heard a conversation on a on a talk show and one of the gentlemen on there was talking about women that are in toxic relationships or abusive relationships and why do they stay mm -hmm. and his opinion was that for some reason some women that are younger they they look for someone that's a a narcissist that they will argue with because they feel had this feeling of well this person's going to protect me in the long run because they're confrontational mm -hmm. what's your opinion on that uh, well, there are many different reasons why people get involved with narcissists. Um, narcissists are very charming when they start out. You yeah. know, they're, they are extremely good at feeding their, their own addiction of, of self-worth. And so, um, and by the time a lot of women and men, you know, men get involved with narcissists too. Um, oh, yeah. That, that by the time you're ensconced in the relationship, it's awfully difficult to leave because you're trying to give your partner the benefit of the doubt. And unconsciously, you don't want to admit that you've gotten had by a narcissist, you know? And so um, I know I've been there. So um, so one of the things is, you, you know, you think you're doing a good thing by giving them a pass or hoping that things will get better um or being supportive of them um narcissists most of them if not all of them don't recognize that they are narcissists you know mm -hmm. uh, if they're what we call ego dystonic they don't get they don't they don't they're not aware of their own dysfunction so it's very difficult to have any kind of rational conversation with a narcissist so it's it's a very tricky situation to be in um but there are many reasons why people don't leave eventually a lot of a lot of people will leave and even that's a difficult process because not only do you have to deal with the sadness of any relationship ending but then there's also the trauma uh and the grieving process of recognizing how much time you spent uh with somebody who wasn't good to you and that's that's uh it's also necessary to grieve that in a loving way okay one more therapy type question and then we want to talk about your book so uh have you ever had uh, um, a, a session with someone a male that was in an abusive relationship but was too embarrassed to admit that they were in a abusive relationship yeah um a, a male yeah yeah definitely um usually because of the nature of my work 
we get pretty upfront pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, I have seen that. Um, and I have, in fact, witnessed that um, in a session. Um, and it's, it's, it's a difficult it's difficult for anybody to, to go through, to go through that. Um, I think men in particular, um, it, it's, it may be more shameful because it, it's emasculating mm -hmm. for some. Um, and it's also, it can also be very, very traumatizing, particularly if they were physically abused as children. And even just spanked, it can bring up a lot and, and it can bring up a lot of childhood wounding as well. And that's something that people may or may not be very willing to jump into and talk about. That's also why it's so important to find a, a counselor, a therapist who is non-judgmental first, and secondly, is, is compassionate and loving at their core because that's exactly what someone like that needs, uh, anyone who has been um, abused in any way. Right. Do you ever feel like it's difficult not to be judgmental sometimes? Uh, as a therapist? Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing it a while, but there are, I'll be honest, you know, there are times that a patient will say something or a belief system that they have. And I feel myself go, Whoa, you know, <laughs> that's oh, okay. But then I, <laughs> I, you know, but then I have to say, wait a minute, this isn't my life. This is theirs. And, and I have to, you know, I just immediately have to switch over to what is this person experiencing and what's not working for them. Cause this isn't about me. This isn't, this is about them. Yeah. So, yeah, but I'm a human being, of course, I, I flinch at certain things that I hear, you know, like, what are you stupid? You know, no, it's not. <laughs> Why are you still in this relationship? But no, I, um, I don't ever say anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get into your book. Now, what inspired you to write this book? Well, um, I wrote it at the end of my thirties. Um, and I, had just come back from a long trip to India where I was working for an NGO. I was single and um, I thought, oh, maybe I'll meet somebody in India. That'll be fun, you know? And of course, what I recognized as soon as I got there was um, in that particular culture, a 37 year old woman who is single is basically dead. <laughs> she, she's, she's too old. So it's just like used goods, done, you know, dried up. And I was so uh, involved in Indian culture that I kind of took that home with me back to New York City. And I was like, oh my God, am I, am I finished? Is there no one out there for me? And I, I realized um, that might actually be true. That might be true that I will never find a partner. Um, so I better be okay with that. I better be okay with, because I don't want to waste my whole life you know, sitting in a rocking chair or something. I want to, I want to have a life that I'm proud of. And I also really love solitude. I love being alone. Um, I also love being with my friends and family. So I'm not, um, I'm not a hermit by any stretch, but, um, but I thought, I wonder if there are other people like me out there. And if there are people like me, I'd love to be able to help them through celebrating what it means to spend time with yourself. And, um, and that's also something that people just don't do. Oftentimes we look outside of ourselves for validation through society. Uh, and, and that's a big one. I would blame everything on society, uh, but society, our friends, our family, as long as they think we look and act and behave okay, or we are, are you know, our job is appropriate or the things we say is appropriate or whatever, then we're okay. But nobody ever really, not nobody, a lot of people don't check in with themselves. Am I okay with the person that I am? So this book is really a guide to help people find out who they are and to celebrate who they are. And mm -hmm. there are many different paths to do that. Um, I think it's important that you at least spend a year uh, by yourself after you've gotten out of relationship. <laughs> you have to get to know yourself again. A lot of times we lose ourselves when we're in a relationship. I mean, what's your advice on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. And this this is exactly the reason why building a foundation of self is so important and celebrating who that person is so that you don't lose yourself in a relationship mm -hmm. in the first place. Do we make compromises for our partners? Of course, of course. we do. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about becoming the person that you think your partner wants you to be. That um, That's not necessary. And if it is, you've got the wrong partner, right? So, right. so it's about finding uh, or not finding a partner at all and, and saying, I'm fine by myself and I, I find my love and my connection in different ways. That's all right as well. You know, we have to drop this Disney fairy tale crap about what relationships should look like. And when we are together, we are one person. No, we're not. We are two individual people who choose to come together and create a third entity, which is the relationship itself. Mm -hmm. But if two whole people come together, then that relationship is going to be very, very healthy. You know, and so the idea is to build yourself so that you can be strong, whether you're with someone or not. And that's the important point. Right? Yeah, I always felt like you, it needed to be 100-100 when you got into a relationship, not 50-50. Right. But I also learned, because I was one of those people that I, I couldn't be alone. I had to have somebody. And so it was one bad relationship after another. And then when I finally just was on my own, learn to to love the things that i loved and remember who i was and then let the next person that i met know this is who i am i'm willing to compromise certain things but there's some things that i i can't compromise on mm -hmm. and then that's when i met my wife that i have now and she has her thing i have my thing yeah you know, she's she worries sometimes that I'm going to get upset if she wants to just go hang out with her friends. I'm like, no, you, you do you girl, go do what yeah. you want. You know, you, you, right. you got to have a life outside of this, this house. You got friends, go hang out with them. I'm, I'm going to expect the same thing when I want to hang out with my friends. Exactly. Um, and you know, I think a lot of people, they think that they have to be attached to the, the hip or something all the time. And that's right. not the way things should be. And if you're that insecure and jealous if they're going to spend time with somebody else then you're not in the right relationship because i was in one of those <laughs> yeah we, we i think we've all been there yeah i think that's part of life um but yeah absolutely a hundred percent you know it's it's really about are you are you able to look at your partner as a separate being mm -hmm. on its on his or her own path and just be in awe of that person and love that person for who they are exactly as they are. And people change over time, not usually not radically, usually the core things stay the same, but they may have may develop new interests or new passions. And that's part of life too. You want to grow as people, right? So to be, to, to be supportive, to be loving, um, but yeah, as you said, to give them also the freedom to to have a life outside of the relationship that is respectful to the relationship, of course, you know, but it's um, it's really important for us to remember that that we are we're all here to learn whatever lessons we're here to learn each of us individually. And so how beautiful that you can spend your life with someone else who's having their own path, their own experience of life. That's right. to me, that's a, that's a great gift to be able to be that close to someone watching, watching, wow, what are they doing? You know, what am I doing? And, and to get that kind of love and support um, as well. Yeah. I mean, fortunately we do have a lot in common, but there's things that she likes to do that I don't particularly care for. Right. And the same thing with me. Yeah, there's things that I like to do. She doesn't care for. Right. Sometimes I go along because I wanted her to know that I support her mm -hmm. and she does the same thing for me. But I also let her know you don't have to have me there all the time. Go hang out with your friends. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a big deal. Right. Yeah, so, that sounds really, really healthy because, you know, it's OK. In fact, it's important to have differences. What matters is to, is what you just said really beautifully, which is go ahead, 
You know, I'm not, I'm not feeling shorted by the fact that you have a life that's separate from me. In fact, what a lot of couples don't realize is that it actually enriches the relationship. When your partner or you go out and have an experience that your partner has not had, then you get to bring that home mm -hmm. and say, Hey, guess what just happened? Now you have a story to talk about, or, or, you know, what was, what was it like? Would you, what, what movie did you guys see? What was it? You know what I mean? So you have, you have a connection that you wouldn't normally have if you're doing every single thing together. That's right. You know, that, that brings up a good point when they're doing something different then then they do have something to talk about when you're together all the time and you're experiencing everything, everything together. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you really have to talk about? Right. Right. You know, except, at least it's, except the stuff that makes everybody bored out of their minds. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, you do the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm confident enough that I trust her. And if she wanted to leave me, I know I would be all right because I've been on my own before, mm -hmm. but I trust her enough that she's going to come back home to me. Now, if you don't have that confidence, maybe the problem is with you and not with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah, what I pretty mean? much. And another good reason to see a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So talk about the podcast. Oh, yeah. Um, so Self Talk with Rachel Astarte was a podcast that started and we're in our three, third year. Um, it started originally uh, for my patients, for my uh, psychotherapy patients. I wanted them to have little snippets of support and, and information in between sessions. Uh, so I started just talking about things like depression, like, uh, like anxiety, like negative self-talk. Um, <clears throat> but then after about a year, uh, I started in doing interviews, which I do now. Um, and it's still, we're, we're talking again about how to enrich our lives, right? So how, mm -hmm. and it's not just the, um, you know, feel good about yourself and eat well and exercise. I mean, we go into some deep stuff about, you know, the shadow, about um, some, you know, even things like uh, talking about deep, physical pain and how that's that can be part of our emotional pain and how to work with that um you said uh you know you've got some you've got some bodily pain you know i have degenerative disc disease that i grapple with and you know so it's like how do we function and and we talk about aging we talk about relationships we talk about anything that that human beings deal with but but the goal is to um really help people understand that a that they're not alone in what they experience and b that that we all have the power to live the life that we're meant to live to shine our light the way that we are meant to shine it every single person on this planet is an individual imagine mm -hmm. that imagine that how much diversity there is just among individual human beings and so my goal in life <laughs> is to get everyone to understand how powerful and beautiful they are even the even the ugly bits right because mm -hmm. we we have darkness we have light but when i say shine your light i don't mean ultra positivity i mean are you dancing your dance on this earth are you doing the thing that you know you feel proud to do and um, whatever that may be, whether it's sweeping streets to running a corporation or, or running a country, it doesn't matter. Are you showing up um, uh, in a clean and clear way, you know, with love? That's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it is important that you, you know, find whatever it is that you want out of life, you do it. Mm -hmm. And don't play the victim. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so tired of this. It seems like everybody's a victim now <laughs> of whatever, mm -hmm. you, you know, take whatever weaknesses you have and, and use, use it, you know, you can make yourself stronger. Knowing your weaknesses can make you stronger. That's the way I feel. Anyway. Yeah. The, yeah, absolutely. And the victim mentality, again, we, we look at that through the filter of love. This is a wounded person. Mm -hmm. So we have to approach that with love. Who hurt you? 
what happened? You know, this is the kind of thing that I would do in a, in a session. And something else I, I just wanted to add about therapy and, and my practice you asked about earlier. Um, I have something that's also a little bit unconventional, which is I offer to people that you can just come and see me for one session. That's pretty unheard of when you when you think about therapists. Uh, they usually want to lock you in for a certain amount of time. And if somebody wants to try it out, if somebody wants to say, look, I've, I, I, I can't afford therapy for the rest of my life, but I know I could afford at least one session with Rachel. So let's just see what we can do in 45, 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take it from there. And, and so I offer that to people. Single sessions are, are uh, better than nothing is often what I say. You know, mm -hmm. it might be just enough. We talk about just enough for you to go out and try some new things and maybe come back in six months and see how they're, they're doing. So it's I'm, I'm very flexible like that because my again, my whole goal is to help as many people as possible in whatever way I can. Well, you know, this this world is can be cruel sometimes and we have things thrown at us that maybe we can't cope with on our own and we do need help. Oh, yeah, uh, it's important that you, you get that help mm -hmm. that uh, don't let it fester because you can end up really hurting yourself or ending yourself. And I don't want to see anyone do that. Don't let yourself be a victim. I mean, I could sit here and tell you all the terrible things that have happened to me. And I know there's somebody else out there that they've had it rougher than, than me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you don't have to be a victim. Go get help, make, get some strength, you know, yeah. have that yeah. re healthy relationship, have balance. I feel like you need balance in your your social life, your work life, your spiritual life, your health, mental right. and physical. So get yeah, that help. And, yes, and and that can sound really overwhelming for someone who's really depressed, mm -hmm. right? Who can barely lift their head off the pillow. So that's what I always say, start small. Start really small. Yeah. You know, as someone who's gone through it myself, lift start by lifting your head off the pillow for five seconds just do that yeah. you know start by sitting up start by taking three breaths and then lie back down again you know anything and then you just do a little a little little every day um yeah. and and everything you said is is so important you know get the help that you need because i mean the people don't know this but the best therapists out there myself included have therapists you know, I've heard that before that if you're not getting help and you're giving help to other people, there's something wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we all it's like this big cycle of of assistance, you know, so don't think so. Even your therapist is saying, you know, I need to talk to somebody because therapists take on a lot of stuff and they have their own stuff, too. So mm -hmm. it's important for them to keep themselves clean and clear, too, so that they can be uh, truly helpful and not bring their crap to the table. Yeah. I feel like we're kind of like cars. We, we run all day long, but eventually we have to stop and get fuel. We have to get our, yeah. you know, oil change, that kind of thing. And yep. weird analogy, but I mean, mm -hmm. even you have, you're out there and you're dealing with people that I, mean, I can imagine hearing some of the stuff has got to be devastating. You have to be recharged too. So absolutely, absolutely. And that's why meditation is helpful. That's yes. why yes. being in nature, you and I talked a little bit about that. Uh, maybe before the podcast, I can't remember what we yeah. talked about. But yeah, we, we talked about a lot. Um, but yeah, being out in nature, taking a walk. Um, I ground every day, every single day, rain, shine, snow, sleet. I go and put my feet on the earth. Mm -hmm. just for a few seconds sometimes a day just to connect with the earth and say thank you for my life you know things like that are are really important tiny little things like that make a huge difference oh yeah get your get your feet bare feet in the grass bare feet. Bare stick it in feet. yeah stick it in the lake stick it in a river stick That's it right. in, in the ocean wherever you might be if you can get into water walk in the water uh, absolutely absolutely or yeah jump in a puddle of, of rain you know oh ab yeah fantastic <laughs> check the puddle first because there might be glass in there everybody yeah, I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry that's the jewish mommy in me <laughs> right, so do you have a website 
I do. Um, you can find me at rachelastartetherapy.com. Um, and, uh, or you can find me at the link tree. So it's so hard to say this one, but it's link tr.ee slash Rachel Astarte therapy that has all my stuff that has the podcast. You'll also find the podcast at Rachel Astarte therapy.com. Um, but, uh, and links to the book and everything like that. So, and also, um, if anyone's interested in, in booking a session, you can do that too. Is uh, the book available on Amazon. Yes, it is. Okay, great. I'm going to put those links in the description so people can just click on it and go straight to it. Uh, social media. Yep. I'm on Instagram at Rachel Astarte therapy. Uh, and then Facebook too. same Rachel Astarte therapy. You can just look me up there. Um, I'm on Twitter. All right. Well, I will put those links up and I, I appreciate your time and my pleasure. thank you for ask, answering my questions. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on your show. All right. And everyone out there, if you are new to the channel, thank you for stopping by. Please subscribe. Um, if you're a regular, thank you for your support. That's because of you. We do what we do and uh, check that subscribe button. If you are subscribed for some reason, YouTube seems to unsubscribe people for no reason huh. but anyway until the next one everyone please take care and be kind to one another god bless and peace we hope you enjoyed this episode of listen to the vibes you can catch us on buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on youtube follow us on facebook at the vibes broadcast network 